Yay. Yay. We're going to get back to our audience questions in just a moment. But let me ask you, because I read your book and you write in your book, I grew up a skinny Asian kid in upstate New York who was often ignored or picked on like one of the kids from Stranger Things, but nerdier and with fewer friends. Yeah, uh, sounds familiar. It stuck with me, you write. How did it stick with you? How did that shape your experience growing up? Well, uh, it made me always want to stick up for the underdog, uh, the person who was left out or marginalized or ignored. Uh, and so when I grew up, uh, one, I'm a Mets fan still. Uh, which they're like a perennial <laughs> underdog. Um, but when I'd go to an event or gathering, I'd, I'd naturally find the person who was uh, excluded or left out and try and include them and bring them in. Uh, and now I've had a passion for entrepreneurship for the last 20 years. And who's being excluded or marginalized right now in America? Unfortunately, it's the working class Americans are working two jobs. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 57% can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. Our economy is now working for more and more Americans, and now I'm running for president to help change that and make us not the underdogs in our own land anymore. You are the son of Taiwanese immigrants who came to the U.S. in the 1960s, and I know in your immigration plan, you support a pathway to citizenship for all undocumented immigrants currently in this country, but you say, quote, it must reflect the fact that these individuals tried to circumvent our legal immigration system. What do you mean by that? Well, we have well over 12 million undocumented immigrants here in this country. And to me, the most logical and humane path forward, path forward is to create a pathway to citizenship for people who are here and undocumented, particularly for the dreamers who really know no other home but the United States of America. And I say to people around the country, I'm the son of immigrants. I believe that immigrants make our country stronger and more dynamic. And so we should try and create a pathway forward to help uh, integrate, really, uh, again, 12 million is a conservative estimate. There are many, many people who are here and undocumented that um, we should integrate into our formal economy and uh, society if we can. But what are you going to do to deter illegal immigration? Well, so right now we have a migrant crisis on the southern border, and it's uh, it's it's in part because the composition of the people who are showing up at the border is changing, where now it's people who are applying for asylum. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have the resources to process them in any kind of punctual or effective way. And so the waiting period is literally over a year in some cases. So the basics are that we need to put more resources to work on our southern border. We need more facilities, caseworkers, asylum judges. Right now, our uh, border patrol is short thousands of people that they've been trying to hire for months because it's very hard for them to attract and retain people to very remote parts of this country. Let's turn back to our audience now. And Constance Young, she's an activist and speaker here in Washington. Constance, go ahead. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a resurgence of white nationalist violence. As a survivor of the deadly car attack in Charlottesville, it is important to me that our next president addresses this issue immediately. Please explain how you will work to curtail this problem, and also please explain whether you will support a bill that defines white nationalist violence as terrorism. Well, first, uh, congratulations to you, Constance, for your incredible work. Let's give her a round of applause. And, and, uh, and, and, and what you've been through. Uh, if the camera people permitted it, I would run out and give you a hug right now. I'm going to give you a hug in the next com commercial break. Because what you've been through sounds incredibly uh, difficult and traumatic. Uh, so to me, right now, this tribalism that's tearing our country apart, it's related um, to a dysfunctional economy. Because if you feel like you don't have a future and your kids don't have a future, and then someone comes up with this, for example, scapegoating immigrants or hateful ideologies, then you're much more subject to those. So by getting the economic boot off of people's throat, hopefully we can help alleviate this tribalism. I'm inspired by the work of Dia Khan, this filmmaker who engaged in something called anti-hate. And so right now, the temptation for many of us is just to condemn uh, racism and hatred, which you know, we should do because it has no place in our society. But then the next step after that is to actually convince the people that these hateful ideologies are incorrect. Uh, and that's more difficult. It's more painstaking. But over time, uh, it's our best path forward to hopefully convince people that there is no place for hate in the United States of America. Mr. Yang, you may know that White nationalists are supporting you online. They seem to have seized on some of your statements, which they say are proof that you are particularly concerned about white people. Why do you think they're drawn to your candidacy? You know, it, it's been a point of confusion because I don't look much like a white nationalist. <laughs> uh, the closest thing we could come up with for it was that I sent, um, I, I retweeted the New York Times saying that 
um, that, um, that Americans are dying of opiates in record numbers, um, so much so that more people are dying than being born in various communities. And those communities are largely white communities in the, the Midwest and the South. Um, so I've completely disavowed any of that support. I don't want the support of anyone who has any kind of agenda that's different than the agenda of this campaign. And our slogan is humanity first. We're trying to solve the problems and improve the lives for tens of millions of Americans. In your book, you do say the group I worry about most is poor whites. Why are you most concerned about that group, poor whites? Well, in the context of my book, I was suggesting to Constance's point, like, uh, how is this uh, tribalism and violence going to manifest itself. And so the group I was most worried about was poor whites who felt like they had no future um, and then that, that violence would emerge in large part because that group would become increasingly um, angry and distressed. And so that's the context of the book. But I am most concerned about that group in terms of the, the nationalism that Constance was describing. All right, let's turn back to our audience questions. Our next guest here is Jose Altamirano. He's a program assistant at Georgetown University. Jose. Hi, Mr. Yang. Rising health care costs and the threat of losing one's insurance is a concern for many Americans. What is your position on Medicare for All, and how do you plan to address the challenge of providing health care for over 30 million uninsured Americans? It's a great question. It's on the minds of many, many Americans. Uh, I'm in the Medicare for All public option camp, generally an applause line in groups like this. No? <laughs> We, right now, we're spending twice as much on our health care to worse effects uh, than other countries. We're spending 18% of GDP. And one of the things that is confusing about this is people are like, where are you going to get the money? Which is completely incorrect. We're spending twice as much on other countries. If we channel our existing resources and negotiate lower drug prices, lower rates, we can get the access up and the prices down and make it so that the people that are struggling, it is immoral that in the richest, most advanced economy in the world, we are more stressed out about navigating our Byzantine dysfunctional healthcare system when our, when our loved ones get sick or injured than we are actually caring for them and, and helping them get well. 